Here we are at the Communicating for Influential Audiences workshop. I'm glad that you actually gave that little preface about influential audiences because I think every audience is influential. They're, they're all so important and it's important that you communicate with them. But I think it is a great point about this kind of snowball effect of when you reach out um, to the media, there's this kind of ripple effect. Um, so I think it is really important to think about that. My sense also from the work that I do is that probably many of you are not that comfortable talking to the media or don't know a whole lot about it or maybe are excited to talk to the media but don't know how or your university or employer is not excited about having you talk to the media so you're trying to negotiate kind of how to deal with that. So I'm really excited that we're working on this today. Just as kind of a brief outline, I'll introduce myself again. I'll repeat some of what um, Sunshine has already said, but just to give you a sense of why am I the person standing in front of you, directing you for the next two hours mm -hmm. almost. We'll kind of warm up with some different writing type activities. I will introduce the field of rhetoric, which is magical and wonderful and you should all adore and you will by noon today. Then we'll get even more warmed up. We'll develop what I would call your rhetorical toolkit that I hope will make more sense soon. And we'll do a lot of practice. So the idea here is not that I will stand up here for the full two hours talking at you and you'll take notes and that's it. Instead, I'll kind of present some ideas. I'll ask you some questions. You'll work through a few things. I'll talk some more. You'll do a little bit of writing. It's about this kind of habitual practice. So, um, as Sunshine said, my name's Caroline gottschalk Drischke. I am a, an associate professor, newly, um, in the departments of writing and rhetoric and natural resources science. So I do have this kind of strange joint appointment across two different departments in two different colleges at University of Rhode Island. Um, I teach in both departments. I have graduate students now in both departments, so I'll advise my first biological and environmental sciences PhD students who are starting this fall and I have students in rhetoric and composition as well. And um, the way that I came to that, because I think it's interesting for people like you who are in the room, most of whom are scientists, but you obviously have some interest in communication, which is why you're here. I am definitely someone who has always been interested in the sciences and in kind of language. I didn't really know how that would work out in an academic setting because it's kind of not set up to work out that way for you. I made a decision sort of in college, maybe late college, okay, I'll stick with language, I'm interested in language, and then realized I was spending all of my time writing as an undergrad and then master's student still in a literature program about urban space, <laughs> about how people use space, about environmental issues in space. Several of my professors said, what you're doing isn't really literature. <laughs> you're kind of interested in like stuff and people and materiality and just how language shapes all that. I said, oh, that's really interesting. And a professor of mine said, yeah, that's interesting and it's called rhetoric. And I said, what in the world is that? And I was like a master's student at that point. So it's not too late <laughs> for me to convert all of you. Um, and so as I worked then, you know, through subsequent, subsequent years, through graduate school, um, through my appointment at University of Rhode Island, I've been really trying to work very deeply across the sciences, especially as Sunshine explained, in kind of issues of natural resource management, thinking about how language, how our perspectives on the world as kind of mediated through language really impact those sorts of decisions, how we affect the environment, how the environment affects us. Bless you. Um, so that's what I do there. In terms of the courses I teach, um, Sunshine outlined this a bit, but I do teach freshmen through PhD students, well through their PhD. I teach a sort of river restoration, social ecological systems of rivers, freshman course. I teach um, community-based writing in a variety of capacities, science writing, graduate science writing. I teach a course called Public Engagement with Science, which is the one that Eric was in. Um, what am I missing? Some internships, things like that. I also work with the CELS Communication Fellows. Rita is a Communication Fellow and they work with Karen Southern also at Metcalf. Another large portion of my time this past year and for the next couple years is spent on an, an initiative, a new initiative called SciWrite at URI. How many of you have heard of that? Anyone? Cool, okay. A number of you. Yeah, right? <laughs> so. Um, SciWrite is a graduate writing initiative that's funded by a National Science Foundation um, IGE award. And so we are starting our first class of graduate fellows this fall. We have um, seven fellows who are starting. 
We also have faculty fellows who will be starting this fall to work for two years on changing their curriculum, learning about how to teach writing and communicate with people. Um, our graduate students will be going through a series of courses as well as working on internships and um, working on how to communicate to a variety of audiences, that being really the key, um, as a way to really improve their science and the science they're doing. So this is kind of the setup of why I'm here, why I, why I think that I'm here. Um, and definitely, you know, there's a focus on rhetoric that I think really is important for what you're going to do. So I'll explain that more. To get started, though, because I do teach writing, I'm going to have you do a little bit of writing. This is very short. You only have to write one paragraph or so. But you can either do this on paper, or if you're someone who is more comfortable writing on your computer, that's fine too. But we're going to take a few minutes for you to think about these questions. Who are you as a writer? How do you feel about writing? I think this stuff seems like sort of a touchy-feely way to start a workshop on writing. But it's really important. It actually is part of becoming a writer. Thinking about yourself potentially as a writer, um, which may not be like the writer that we envisioned in our heads as the, the Edgar Allan Poe writer, the Maya Angelou writer, but you are someone who writes all the time. All of you are sitting in this classroom writing stuff all the time. Your jobs are filled with writing. Your personal lives are filled with writing. I mean, I'm texting all the time. I'm emailing people all the time. So there is a lot of writing there. I also bring that up because Maybe one thing, I think it's really important for you to think more about, to learn more about your relationship to writing. That will make you a better writer to think about, what do I enjoy? What do I not enjoy? How can I change what I don't enjoy to make it a little more like what I do enjoy? Um, but also to say that I empathize with you. So I often think of myself, I have said in meetings over and over, you have probably heard me say this, especially in my, early in my years at URI, I am not a writer. I am not a writing teacher. Largely because that was kind of blocking some of the other research things that I do. But as I've had more time to examine this, I realized I'm really not a writing teacher. I'm a rhetoric teacher, and I'll talk more about that. And also that I'm not a writer in the view of what I think of as a writer. But of course I'm a writer. We're all writers. We're all writing all the time. And so kind of owning that, getting in touch with that, realizing what you enjoy writing and what you don't, valuing your style of writing, so valuing being a nonlinear thinker, that's a great thing, potentially. You know, um, It's also a great reason to talk with other people about your writing, to collaborate with people on writing, to review your writing. You may want to partner up with someone who is a very linear thinker, kind of think, OK, how could I maybe shape this and find some happy medium between the two? So um, that's the approach we're going to take today, is to think in part about embodying your writerliness but also realizing that there's this whole other thing about rhetoric and argument and context and audience that's really important to what you're doing. So instead of being a writer, as I said, I would say I am a rhetorician, to which you're thinking, what the hell is that? <laughs> so I'm going to try to explain that. There is a kind of colloquial definition of rhetoric that I think we hear on NPR, we hear on sort of news broadcasts. <laughs> looking at Trump or other political candidates say, oh, that's just rhetoric, meaning it's nonsense or empty, it's all for show. Instead, there is this beautiful, wonderful tradition of rhetoric that emerges as early as Aristotle, but really earlier. We are the oldest discipline and the best, <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> um, but we are like the oldest discipline, basically, um, of studying really persuasive argument, how people are moved to action through language. Um, which I think is a really beautiful thing to think about. So Aristotle's definition of rhetoric was the faculty of discovering in any particular case all the available means of persuasion. So certainly there's a focus in rhetoric on persuasion, on thinking about not just sort of language as simply aesthetic, kind of floating ideas out there to look at, but that it pushes and pulls us. I think people often think of persuasion maybe more directly than rhetoricians think of persuasion. So persuasion is not just necessarily a speech or a grant proposal, although certainly it is. You're trying to argue for something. But we like to think of persuasion even in very subtle ways in our field. So how do humans connect over a particular conversation or a particular idea? Or um, we even talk a lot about things like memorial sites or spaces, things that kind of pull us in particular directions and away from that. But that may be more esoteric than you need at this point. But thinking about these persuasive capacities of language. 
Rhetoric can be a way to determine um, accurate, useful, or valuable opinions. So it can be used really kind of critically to assess what's out there around you. So that's useful in a uh, in election year, right? <laughs> Thinking about what are people telling us? What is the truth in that? What's, what's the logic in that? Is there a piece of the logic that's missing in that? There is no greater joy that rhetoricians take than is like watching the convention, <laughs> looking at po political ads, thinking about like, oh, that's how this works. Um, the issue of, and I won't get hugely into this, but Melania Trump's speech at the RNC, which I'm sure everybody's heard about ad nauseum at this point, was a really interesting conversation among my nerdy rhetoric friends because in part, people are talking about it as, or in large part, they're talking about it as an issue of plagiarism. Some of us were talking about, well, where's the line of plagiarism and the things that you hear in a political speech, every time there's a political speech, there are the same sorts of types of speech and things that we copy. Anyway, so all of this really matters to your work lives and your personal lives and your civic lives. Um, rhetoric does help us kind of create and construct sort of criticize and also create their own writing. The thing with rhetoric is that there are many definitions of rhetoric. So you don't need to necessarily subscribe to one or the other, but all of them sort of get at issues of um, human communication, studying misunderstandings and their remedies, the use of language as a symbolic means of inducing cooperation, a mode of altering reality, the instrumental use of language, um, all about this kind of pushing and pulling through language. I posed this question to some friends of mine <laughs> on an informal Facebook poll and came up with essentially a million different definitions. No one could exactly settle on one. We had it depends, you know, these are all rhetoric professors across the nation. <laughs> Study in the art of doing, we have this oh dear, <laughs> very well known rhetorician. Discussion, study and practice of articulating articulants articulately. I mean, they go on and on and on. But you get the idea, all about language, all about kind of how we connect and how we divide. Um, what else do we have? A form of meaning making about probabilities, power, everything, word, on and on and on and on and on. So um, don't feel badly if you don't have a working definition of rhetoric, but you get the idea that it's about this kind of like wider context. Yeah. So in a nutshell, the version of rhetoric that I think is somewhat workable and applicable to you folks, and this comes from a paper that I published with my colleague Bridie McGreevy from the University of Maine in Frontiers in February, is that rhetoric is the academic discipline devoted to the persuasive power of language, including argument, public discourse, and civic engagement. It seeks to understand how people interact with one another in their environments and how communities, human communities form, so kind of how we pull together argue. And I'll give you a copy of this paper. We'll send it out. The PowerPoint's available. So you won't be quizzed on this. Don't worry about it. But that's the paper in Frontiers, Why Rhetoric Matters for Ecology. The kind of bottom line point that we make in that paper is that the study of rhetoric, and not just of writing, and not just of communication, can inform academic writing, also public writing, certainly what we're worried about here today, can help inform broader impacts activities, so that sure matters for the grants that you're writing, thinking about what are these kind of meaningful pub broader impacts that we're gonna have. Rhetoric is super important to collaboration, so anytime you're trying to um, join teams, Emily and I are on a huge, expansive cabin as well, this large, you know, 30 person, 40 person, 50 person research study well, how do you negotiate across that number of people? How do you figure out what directions are we going in? How do we have team meetings? How do we set research questions? Those sorts of things. Um, as well as any kind of interest in wicked problems, sustainability science, any of those sorts of questions. So that's all fine and good, but how do we do that concretely? So that's what we'll start to get into. Um, as I promised, I am here to help you create a rhetorical toolkit for yourselves. The idea here is that um, this is kind of the way that I teach writing. So thinking about not just teaching one specific genre or one specific assignment, you know, you'll get that this afternoon, which is useful. You need that in certain ways. But the teaching that I do is really about giving you some flexible tools that hopefully you'll be able to take into any sort of writing that you have to do to be able to assess kind of what is the situation that I'm writing to, what do I need to know? How can I figure out who my audience is? 
What sorts of writing strategies can I use, like free writing, like peer review, like discussing with other people, in any of those situations? So that's what I'm going to try to work on in my morning that you can then carry into these more specific projects later. So rhetoric at its heart is really interested in exigence, some sort of pressing need. So rhetoric is very interested in these moments at which, at which there is a call to respond in some way. That might be a vote. That might be a request for proposals. That might be that you've discovered something really awesome in your lab and you think that it's noteworthy or important that some particular person knows that. Um, but there's some sort of call to respond in some way. That really drives the sort of communication that we do in rhetoric. Rhetoric is also very interested in, as I said earlier, embodiment and kind of thinking about we use our bodies, our hands, our computers, our voices in very particular ways that communicate differently across those, those different things. And we think a lot about creating an embodied practice of writing. So thinking about getting yourself writing, picking up your pen, getting, getting a piece of paper, writing, writing, writing. We also definitely think about rhetoric as social. So the idea is that you are not a sole author up in a room alone writing into the void. Instead, you are intervening in these social situations and that you're, you're always in conversation with other people. Even if those other people are invisible to you at any moment, you are writing to people who are going to respond to your text. So in the teaching that I do and certainly in the SciWrite program that I mentioned earlier, the way that we have kind of translated these into practice, and I think these are useful for you to think about, is that we really focus on three things, multiple genres, habitual writing, and frequent review. And what we mean by that is that it's important for you to start to think about writing across these different situations in different ways. So you have good practice writing grant proposals. You have good practice maybe writing dissertation proposals or papers for class, or um, the stories that you write, those features you know, about people. You have a lot of practice doing that. What will make you a better writer is working across genres and really thinking about what do those different types of assignments entail? How do you need to work differently? How does your voice need to change? What else do you need to know? How does, what counts as evidence? What counts as argument? Um, what is the style? What are those conventions? And that developing some of the, that flexibility, which is really about just practicing doing that kind of over and over again, practicing across these different genres, will make you a better writer. I suspect it will also make you a better scientist because you'll be thinking about problems in different ways flexibly. That's a good thing, right? Um, in terms of embodiment, we're really focusing a lot in the classroom on habitual writing. And what I mean by that is creating a habit of writing thinking about when you write, how you write, um, what music is playing, really into music when I write. Typically each manuscript that I've written has one particular song on repeat as I'm writing it. So I can go back to anything I've published and I'm like, oh yeah, that was you know this song, that was this song, that was this song. I thought about including that in a note to say when you read this, you might really want to listen to blank. <laughs> but it kind of wires your head into writing in a particular way. And learning about yourself and learning about what works well for you really matters. And then this point about um, the socialness of writing, about frequent review, is about starting to think about writing, if you don't already, as a social practice. Getting a group of people you write with. Getting people in your lab or people in your classes. Share writing with them. Share ideas with them. That doesn't necessarily always have to be like finished, complete writing. That can be a couple of research questions or a really nonlinear page that's like, there's some idea in this. I don't really know what to do with this. But get in the habit of really talking with other people about your writing. I know that for many people that can be terrifying. That is like the worst form of hell for some of the students that I have. And honestly, I think you can sort of numb yourself to it by doing it repeatedly. That if it's something that's absolutely terrifying to you, all the more reason to do it, get in the practice of it, and finally it will just come naturally. It just can't be that terrifying for that long. You can't sustain anxiety that long. <laughs> you just have to like power through it. And it really will help your writing. So think about sharing your writing with others, creating a regular practice of writing, and practice writing across genres to multiple exigences. This will make you a better writer. Okay, <coughs> so to think about your, your position in kind of each of these things, this is where we're actually going to get up and move across the room, okay? 
So what I want you to do, you can stand up. We're going back to this question of do you enjoy writing? Just thinking about what is your positionality in writing? Because this is exactly what we're talking about here, that these are different styles of writing, different audiences, different situations, different expectations. One of the things that I do in my science writing classes is that I typically build in a lot of review over time and very small pieces of projects. That's really important for dissertation writing, but I think it can be important for a variety of things. And even though things will come up with these short deadlines, often if you're kind of always engaged in this process of writing, you're always working on pieces of things, you're sharing your writing, sometimes that can deflate some of the anxiety of a deadline because you're just working in small pieces. You're able to see this, okay, I'm gonna get this chunk done, this chunk done, this chunk done. Sometimes that will help with that. But I think you are raising a really important issue too that we shouldn't lose about the difference of different audiences getting very used to working in one way, in one voice, in one genre. It can be very difficult to get out of it. And I think one of the ways to get out of that and practice that is to kind of think about working across multiple genres, practice on working in different ways, and thinking really very concretely about what are those different expectations when I do that. Okay, next question on this thinking about kind of habitual writing, creating this habit of writing. When do you write? If you are very structured, even for those of you who are scattered across the room this way, have you realized that you write better at a certain time? Emily, you're nodding, yeah. Are you a morning, morning, morning thinker, yeah. Other morning people, do you notice you're better? I mean, I, complete, I can only write in the morning, which is why I don't like to meet with people in the morning, because I'm like, I only have like three good hours in my head. I don't want to use those for meeting. <laughs> you can have me at three in the afternoon, that'll work. Um, yeah, so even if you don't realize it, start to think about, oh wait, there's a particular coffee shop where I get a lot of work done, or a particular chair, or a height of chair, or a time of day, those sorts of things. I mean, <laughs> truly, and so these are things to think about for you people. We've talked about time, temperature, probably darkness or lightness, definitely ambient noise. I mean, some of you will realize you really need a quiet place. It sounds like, Jason, you need, it's quiet, you're alone, right? Yeah, um, I need like major noise, like total ADD, people everywhere, noise everywhere, but it needs to be at a level that I can sort of ignore, like it needs to be very background. So it's a lot of music, so I think it's important to think about. You may not be someone who needs a silent place to write. That may be the worst thing for you. That's the worst thing for me. I cannot write in silence at all. Like in a situation like that, I would just sit there like. <laughs> <laughs> but I can concentrate if all this stuff is going on. So I would encourage everyone, especially <laughs> in this whole swath of the room, to just start paying attention even when you are working on a project. Oh, I'm getting a lot of writing done today. What's going on? Where am I? What am I wearing? <laughs> What's the temperature like? Am I outside, inside, loud place, quiet place? Start to think about those things. And then when you have success, recreate that success. And sure, some weeks are different than others. You can't always get that time. But it really, really is important to like guard whatever time you figure out works for you and guard it with your life and do that. So on this question of kind of social writing, sharing your writing, how often do you share your writing? If you always share your writing with other people, you're kind of involved in drafting, you're bouncing around with your lab mates, things like that, go to this side, you're doing a lot of collaborative writing. If you never want anyone to see your writing ever, you can go on this side. If you're sort of in between, in between works, would suggest you need to find people to review your work, to share your work with in whatever way who you trust, you know, who are people who you feel comfortable with. It's really important to think about what is your level of sort of anxiety with sharing your writing? Is that something that will shut you down? Because you don't want that, certainly. But can you find maybe one or two people who you do finally get comfortable with enough that you can share writing in the early phases? Um, certainly understanding when it's helpful for you to get feedback seems really important, and I'm hearing that over here. You know, do you need feedback right away? Or do you really realize, I need to get some ideas out, I need to make this make some sense, and that's what I wanna hear. So I would always urge you to get some feedback from people, but you need to find the right people, you need to figure out when that's gonna be helpful. Certainly I've had people that I share my work with where I realize, oh, 
they make me really uncomfortable <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> or, or they're just thinking very differently, not in kind of a useful different way, just in a, that may be too, too differently than what I'm working on and that's not helpful. So thinking about how to cultivate that group that you can work with, that may be lab mates, that may be people in your classes. Um, it may be people at a different university who you just really respect. It may be a friend of yours. It may be your mom. I've had my mom read stuff. She's a good reader of things. You know, she can provide some insight. Um, so think about who should do that and when you want that done, but you should definitely try to get in the habit, even if it can be uncomfortable at first, try to get in the habit of sharing some writing and see if you can kind of find a comfortable way to do that, because it will really help you. Really important to know that there are people in your discipline who can read things for you when that's appropriate and that you can find some people outside of your discipline to share things with. Um, often I find having an informed reader, like someone else who's maybe a PhD student but not in your sub-discipline, sort of broadly in your discipline, often that can be a great reader because it's someone who knows enough to follow along but they don't know everything that you're going to say. And particularly as you're starting to do this sort of work that you'll write this afternoon, news releases, op-eds, getting people who don't know anything about what you do is the key. Don't get your major professor to read what you're doing. Or, you know, get your major professor to make sure it's factual, but really you need to find someone else. Not that it wouldn't be, but you know, that whatever, you get it. Um, but getting someone who doesn't know about what you do to make sure that it makes sense is hugely, hugely important. Okay, the last one of these kind of movement questions, developing a writing practice. What types of writing have you done in the past year? We've been talking a lot about different types. You have one style, one process for one type, a different process for another type. If all of your writing has been kind of academic writing, scientific articles, proposals, grant reports, that sort of thing, kind of academic or technical writing, you can go against that wall. If you've been doing that as well as like newsletters, press releases, blogs, kind of public writing, and I think you guys are, are um, expressing well this kind of variety of things that I would bet even in this group there's a variety of different types of writing that you're doing that kind of fall in the academic writing. So there are a variety of things you're working on and then this even kind of wider variety. I would bet that kind of increasingly more of us will have to shift to this side, maybe not every single one of us, but that's my sense even in just five years at URI. I see people kind of more and more expected to do this mix, like do a lot of academic writing, do a lot of other types, or at least be able to explain yourself well enough so that someone else can write about you. Um, so I think you know the idea that you're here, that you were interested in this topic enough to show up is, is a great sign and I think will work very well for you. Um, so you can go ahead and sit down, if you were. And I just want to remind you that you know this is the thing you'll be working on this afternoon, is, is thinking about how the work that you're doing, the maybe more kind of scientific technical thing, will fit into news releases, fit into op-eds, will enable you to talk with, um, with media. And certainly grab a drink or coffee as you need to. But the sort of key point that I want to make, one of the key points, is that writing is not writing is not writing. <laughs> By which I mean, there isn't just kind of one thing that is writing. Okay, I just need to sit down, I need to write up something about my research and I can go home and I'm done. Instead, the whole idea behind teaching you about rhetoric and how rhetoric informs writing is that you are always writing to an audience or multiple audiences. You are always writing with particular constraints, whether or not you like those or don't like those. There are always some kind of constraints out there, some of which you can kind of play with, some of which you can't. And so we think a lot in rhetoric about what genre are you writing in? So what is the form? Is it a tweet? Is it a Facebook post? Is it a manuscript? Is that a manuscript for frontiers? Or is it a manuscript for bioscience? Or is it a manuscript for whatever? Different journals are very different, as you well know. So thinking about what is that type of writing that you're being asked to do. Often there's a little bit of flexibility there, but not a ton. So you need to get skilled at recognizing what are those expectations? What am I being asked to write? When I'm thinking about an idea for an academic paper, one of the first things that I do now is think, where would this go? <laughs> what journal would want to see this? And then I'm writing specifically to that journal. Like, oh yeah, here's the college composition and communication version. Here's the bioscience version. Here's the whatever version. You just have to get in that. There is a real 
forum. There is a real form, a real style, a real audience, and writing to that, even in academic writing, is really important. Also thinking about purpose. What is your text trying to do, whether that's an academic text, um, a technical text of some kind, or the email, the newsletter going out. What, what is it trying to do? It's trying not to get people to say, take me off this list. <laughs> you know, that there are consequences. Thinking about what are you trying to get done? And certainly, I would expect in the afternoon, thinking about news releases and op-eds, you need to be thinking about what is the point. The comment that I write most often on student papers that I mean in a very gentle, soft way, but maybe comes across harsh, is so what, question mark. Like, why does this matter? I know that it does matter, but unless you tell me why it matters, I don't know why it matters. So thinking a lot about purpose, and then thinking about audience. Who's reading your text? Who do you think will read your text? Who might in the future read your text? And how can you really connect with them, persuade them? Then the trick with rhetoric and kind of writing rhetorically is to think about all those as kind of deeply entwined with each other. That really matters quite a lot. So the way that we have talked about this for years and years and years, like dating back to Aristotle, is thinking about what we call the rhetorical situation. So thinking about a particular author, kind of who are you as a writer, what do you know, what sort of credibility do you have, what knowledge do you have, thinking about you in this kind of broader context that you're writing in to a particular audience. That's kind of the static rhetorical triangle. Did anyone get this in like a college composition class? Yeah, one person did. Two people, no? Yeah? Oh. You don't have to remember it, but, but you, this looks vaguely, vaguely familiar. Yeah, this comes up in college composition. If you had a first year writing class, you probably would have learned that. The rhetorical situation, people have started to teach in somewhat more complex ways, although the triangle is kind of a nice, easy, like, oh, right, writer, purpose, audience. So thinking maybe the rhetor is another word for the writer or speaker, thinking about audience, about the text and kind of form of text, about the exigence, as we heard, the thing that's prompting you to ask. What people in rhetoric now really talk a lot about <laughs> is um, the rhizome, the rhetorical rhizome. Any of you into like French philosophy? Deleuze, Guattari? No, okay. Um, they wrote an awesome piece about the, the rhizome. Are any of you plant people? Nobody? Yeah, oh yeah. So I'll send this to you. You should read it. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous. Um, so we think about something more like a, a rhizomatic structure, like things are connected, they kind of pop up, they disappear, you cut off something, but it still grows underground. Um, that the more that you can think about writing as this sort of rhizomatic piece, that your writing might be right here, but what you're not seeing is that it's connected to all this, it's influenced by all this. The more that you can kind of get that into your head, that you're not just a person writing something on your computer and nobody else and nothing else exists in the world, the better your writing will be. You need to start kind of revealing this wider context. Another way that we talk about that in rhetoric is about rhetorical ecologies. I don't love that because I work with ecologists and so that's just confusing, <laughs> I think. But to think about this situation not just as a static situation, but this kind of lived, dynamic, flexible situation that you're writing in. And thinking about, you know, where are you in this? Are you the central node? Are you kind of out here? Is everything sort of equally connected in terms of power and hierarchy or not? The point for us today <coughs> is that audience, the thing that you were promised I would talk about, <laughs> Is, um, is central to kind of understanding where you are in that rhizomatic structure, what you're trying to do, who you're connecting with. That's, a, that's really a great thing to focus to. So once again, I'm going to have you talk through a couple things. You can just stay where you are in your seats, but you'll talk with a small group of people around you. And what I want you to do, see if you can explain the NCAA tournament to a small child, say a two-year-old. A lot of teams, who's the best? Very abstract. They might even need to know what a team is, depending on if it's like early to or late to. Um, best, they'll understand, you know, but like that's it. Very little context or explanation. Okay, try again in your small groups. Explain it to your adult friend here. <laughs> we could have this in a couple groups. Who doesn't know much about basketball? So here's the version of, again, someone who doesn't understand what's, what this is about. Okay, so let's hear from you this time. All the groups. We've had a couple of interesting versions of this, but does someone have a good explanation of 
what would you tell a grown-up? They had to, uh, Tori had an interesting one, like, well, does the person care about basketball or not? Which is a great audience, like, specifically, what, the, what is the audience? That's exactly the question you should start to raise in your writing. But who, does someone want to offer just, like, a nice bullet point? What would you say? What did you say? You just talked through this. Yes? It's a single elimination basketball tournament of 64 teams. OK. Great. You might have to explain single elimination to a couple people. How would you explain that? Um, if you lose, you're out. OK. If you lose, you're out. <laughs> if you win, you keep playing. If you lose just once, you're out. I think that works well. <coughs> and then finally, in your small groups, very briefly, how would you explain the NCAA tournament to Michael Jordan? I would say another acceptable answer is that you wouldn't have to. You don't have to explain the NCAA tournament to this audience. This audience already knows, right? So how did those explanations vary? Just a couple things. The two-year-old, no jargon. There was no single elimination in that one, right? It was just, it was best team, kind of very abstract, very generic. Got to the point, though, that really the idea is to screen out to the best team. That's like the ultimate point of the tournament, but super generic. Um, you had the great question for talking with other adults. Well, do they really care about it? Do they not care about it? Do they really want to know kind of the intricacy of how it works? Or do they just want to know what people are watching on TV would vary? And certainly knowing something about your audience or knowing that your audience already knows this thing matters. So think about if you're writing a grant, say, to someone who is an expert in the exact thing that you do. Um, there will be some background information you don't have to give, probably, and then there will be some things that you will need to be extraordinarily precise about because they can catch you on it. <laughs> you know, they know what you're actually talking about. So understanding in this kind of like dumb public example matters a lot, but in these really high stakes consequential examples matter a lot. And certainly as you're working on news releases, op-eds, you need to be thinking about what audience am I writing to? What newspaper is this? What do these people know? What do they not know? What do they care about? Do they care about what I'm talking about or not? If they already care, I need to do much less work setting up why they need to care, and I can tell them the thing. If they don't care, I need to spend a lot of time persuading them to care. So that really matters. OK, we're going to do a bit of a writing exercise that builds on this idea about audience. So you can write, again, either on your computer or on paper. You're welcome to get up and get coffee or whatever if you want. Um, but I want you to write, this is very brief, but a three to four sentence paragraph describing your current research project. I'll pick one that you're on or something similar. To a leading researcher in your field. Picture who that person might be and then write to that particular person. What is it that you do? So take a few minutes to do that. Okay, so why don't you finish off your sentence on that one. And then I want you to do something slightly and subtly different. So you're going to write another version of that that explains your current research project, the thing you just described to a hyper-specialist, well-respected person in your field, to this group here, or to me specifically. <laughs> um, and so what you know about this audience, we're all pretty broadly kind of a science audience. So people who have a good bit of expertise broadly, um, but are not necessarily specifically in your field. OK, so you have one version that's written to this specialist in your field. You have one version that's written to kind of an educated, more generalist audience. I want you to go back and read those to yourself. So just go back and look at those side by side. And just jot down a couple ideas about what are the differences between them. What were you kind of thinking about differently as you did them? What are you trying to convey differently? How did they need to change for those two different audiences? So take just two minutes or so just to jot down a couple ideas about that. So how many of you changed the terminology that you were using across those two descriptions? Great. Beautiful. Yes. You might think about keeping one or two terms that's really important, maybe you did that, and defining them as you were explaining. So if there's some term that's absolutely essential to the thing that you do, you don't have to necessarily strike that for a different audience, but you do want to explain what that is, explain why it matters to your work. You know, Think about those one or two terms that really do matter and define those. We talk about this a lot in the profiles that you're doing. Like, Is there something really technical that needs to stay because it's important to know and people can learn about it? 
or can you just talk about it in a different way? That's an important thing to think about. And you can imagine then, if you're now turning to writing news releases or op-eds kind of across the spectrum, you're gonna veer even more into being really cautious about keeping any jargon, being really kind of direct and short and punchy and interesting in those sentences. Um, you explain kind of needing an introduction to this audience. I would suggest that that, that introduction is gonna be very punchy and catchy and interesting <laughs> to hook their attention along the lines of what Claudette was saying of getting people to read past that first line, really hooking them into why it matters and what you do. Um, we're gonna skip this next one because we're short on time, or I'm short on time. But you could try again with thinking about how would you explain this to your grandma? How would you explain it to your mom? How would you explain it to a kid? Really thinking about how you're talking about that same thing, but you're talking about it in very different ways, in a variety of different ways, different language choices, length of sentence, all of that stuff, organizational structure. So I would suggest that um, we're actually very good, I think, at this kind of shifting of audience in our daily lives. Little kids are good at that. You know, they know when they're talking to a friend or talking to a parent. You know, if you're asking your friend to do something versus asking your grandma to do something. We're making all of these really flexible adjustments all the time. And I think many of us kind of forget it or lose it somehow when we're writing for work or writing in the academy. It's like, ooh, I need to really make some serious changes here. That makes sense to me because in some ways we're kind of focused so much on I have to do this important research, I have to like explain it very clearly to an audience that you almost forget the audience because you're really focused on doing the research. But it really matters. Why does it matter? Well in part, and I can send you a reading about this that you could send out, a really good kind of basic one, is this point, I know this is hard to see, but this point about a deficit model of communication versus a contextual model. So what I would love for you to come away from this workshop today thinking is to try to get out of this I have really important research I'm gonna throw it at you and it's gonna stick to you like glue and you're gonna be transformed and walk away and I don't need to think about what you need or what you know or what you care about and instead shifting into this much more engaged version of connecting with audiences which is this much more rhetorical version of who are my audiences who are they what do they know what do they need what do they want how do I reach them to then persuade them and kind of pull them in and learn from them and listen to them at the same time? And I'll send this to you, so don't worry too much about this. So you should be contextualizing your work. You should think about this kind of two-way flow between science and its publics. Um, don't assume that your audience is already persuaded that what you do matters. In many cases, they will not be, and it's your, really your job to explain, no, this is why this matters, in whatever reason it matters. It doesn't even necessarily need to matter um, in terms of having like some obvious public output. Instead, you just need to explain why it's useful, <laughs> relevant, important, even if that's in your particular field, but you need to explain that. Um, so we talked a little bit about the different audiences that you write for. I just wanna give you in my last seven minutes a couple of tools to take with you or kind of ways to think about this, and I'll be sharing these with Sunshine to share with you. But in rhetoric, we often teach students um, this tool of rhetorical analysis. These are all the things that we've been talking about already. They're just kind of boiled into a list. So as you're either reading something else or you're composing something yourself, you should be thinking about these questions of exigence. What is prompting me to write this thing? Um, what is the intention of it? Who are these, what we call primary, secondary, tertiary audiences? Maybe you have kind of this primary audience, well, it's gonna be this particular subdiscipline or this particular group in this neighborhood, but certainly there are multiple types of audiences, and what are those? What's the major content of what you're working on? What sorts of appeals are you using um, to persuade people? Can you be emotional? Do you need to be strictly factual? How much credibility do you have or can you borrow someone else's credi credibility by quoting someone else or referring to someone else's work? Um, what sorts of traditions are you building from? Um, how can you use those? What is the form or the genre that you need to follow? How do form and content really fit together? Kind of what are you able to say? How are you able to argue based on that format? And what are the consequences? I would suggest both intended and unintended. What are you trying to do? And what might be the things that could happen that you don't want to happen? And what are ways to mitigate those? And I think certainly with news releases and op-eds, you need to be thinking about unintended consequences. 
I think you may already be thinking about these. Your advisors may already be thinking about these. Are there things that you don't want to say or can't say publicly? You need to be aware of those. Are there possible negative impacts of what you're saying? And then there are ways to work around those. Another tool that we use is um, forum analysis. And the idea behind a forum analysis is really thinking, OK, I have this particular outlet. So let's say that's the Providence Journal. I don't know if they'll decide maybe this afternoon on a particular newspaper you're thinking about writing for. Hopefully you will, or you're able to identify one, or a neighborhood paper or whatever. You want to be thinking about for that forum, that news forum, the Providence Journal, or whatever, um, what is the editorial po policy? What's the philosophy of the paper? Um, who are its leaders? Who is its readership? What's its history? For newspapers, what's its politics? You know, like, w what is that? What do they typically include or exclude? What kind of point do they usually make? Um, who writes for this venue? Who writes the most? Who decides who writes? So this is applicable, of course, to academic manuscripts you might write, but certainly to public writing as well. What important sources are cited? What knowledge is assumed? Um, questions about audience, who is addressed? What do we assume about the audience? What are their needs? What do they know? What's their background? I know I'm repeating, but this is kind of condensed for you here. What are their beliefs, attitudes, values, or prejudices? What are they coming into this with about the thing that you're trying to tell people? Um, and how can you speak to that directly? What topics or issues does the newspaper usually consider? What do they allow? What do they seem to think is valuable or not valuable? Um, what counts as evidence as you're making some kind of point? What sort of genre are they working in? Is there technical jargon, as Pamela was saying? Do they use abbreviations? How does tone work? What sort of position are you allowed to take on an issue? These are all hugely important questions to be asking yourselves and to be writing towards in each particular forum or venue or journal or newspaper that you write in. But I will encourage you as you work into this afternoon session and as you go away from here and hopefully think about writing news releases or supporting people who write news releases or working on op-eds, um, that you start to ask these questions. If you think you might be publishing an op-ed or you might be interested possibly in sending an op-ed to like the Narragansett Times or you know a town paper, start reading it religiously and start making a note of these things. Like what comes up? What, what do they seem to publish? What do they seem to care about? What do people seem to assume? And that all of those things are hugely important to the thing that you're going to write, to the possibility of it being published, um, to its potential impact and the kind of ripples it has. So I think I'm going to stop there and just ask if you, that was more of the same really, um, just to say, you know, remember you have a bunch of tools here just from today. Thinking about creating a habit of writing, when do you write best, where do you write best, um, how do you write best, thinking about trying to incorporate more review into the work that you're doing, sharing it with trusted people who can give you good feedback, trying to practice writing across different kind of genres and situations, um, thinking about how you can use rhetorical or forum analysis. Again, I'll share those resources with you. And remembering too that it's okay to do things like free writing or another version of this called concept mapping where you're just really kind of visualizing things, putting them together with arrows and doodles. That, that counts as writing. That's really important writing work. That's not like wasted time or junk hours. Um, hugely, hugely important. And if doing that in a linear way doesn't work for you, it doesn't have to be a linear way. I always like graph out stuff. My dissertation was a huge poster board with like bubbles and arrows. <laughs> that was my dissertation until it turned into a dissertation. Um, so just finding strategies that work for you to do that kind of like low level, low stress writing that turn into the important writing you're doing. So I have like one minute um, to answer some questions. And thanks for your attention. And you can email me with any questions too.